basically what we're trying to do is just come out here and get rid of the trash first okay and then get it into testing as okay. you say we'll we'll get some top end yield locations where we'll spoon feed it nitrogen under irrigation mm -hmm. Like our, our Rochester loke, yep. We'll get some stressier soil south of Indy, yep. Um, where the soil's shallower, we're gonna, sure. we're gonna get some stress down there, sure. and then we can start to play with those environments uh -huh. to make sure we're picking things that perform well across, across both the types. Because yeah. you can't predict the year. No, exactly. no. And one year you may have one of those environments, one yeah. year you may have the other. And yes. So if you can kind of polarize your environments, uh -huh. that's part of. You kind of go down the middle of the road. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Will you mess with something here? So, like, so you have yeah. something. How many years will you, or how many cycles? Are... So that's a, that's a perfect. That's an awesome question. Basically, we will mess with something here about three or four years okay. before it starts to graduate into okay. The, okay. the major leagues. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when I say the major leagues, I'm talking entering strip trials in sure. you know, North America yeah, wide. Yeah. Um, it, and that's just the start of it. We, we'll go three or four years on top of that before okay. we commercialize something. Gotcha. But with predictive breeding and analytics that we're using here, we are shaving time off the funnel. So we're going faster and we're able to screen through a lot more genetics much quicker as well. We're making sure they don't do anything stupid here, like mm -hmm. root lodge per se, uh -huh. brittle snap, yeah. that type of stuff. Yeah. So that's what we're doing. But in the past, that's all we could do. Okay. And then we would take several thousands uh, of ge uh, genetic genetics and get them down to a you know a few thousand okay and then we'd actually start yield testing that now what we're, we're we have the capability is we're leveraging our yield trial data that we generate every year for for you know say the last decade okay we're taking all that yield data combining it with the genetic data every one of these lines out here has um, we have the dna information on every one of these lines mm -hmm. but i can get a prediction on this line that you're looking at right here for every trait that we're that's that you would in. Every yeah. trait. Not only am I looking at all the, the, the genetics in my breeding program, I'm looking at all the genetics across the globe oh, wow. to make predictions. Okay. So now if mm -hmm. I was in the say tens of thousands, now you're talking hundreds of thousands that right. I'm scanning with genetic models that are trained locally in the east, we're maintaining that game by, by recycling those genetics faster sure. yep. and kind of staying on them, but we're diversifying too, but we're staying on that yield gain and we're making a ton of improvement. So you look at the next generations coming out, the, the 1185s of the world, big time. This is totally different genetics than the 1197 okay. lineage, than you know the 1185 type of well, thing or the 1359. Yeah, totally different lineage, doesn't have the the Christmas stay green, I call okay. it, is 1197. It, it's going to, okay. it's going to lose its color, but it's going to okay. be perfect. It, it, it's got northern leaf light tolerance for the, for the east. Okay. But what's nice about this is it gives you that diversity, and that's why I really like about Corteva breeding, like we talked earlier. You're picking up diversity with yeah. that. We're not breeding with a few few genetics out here, exactly. making large populations. We're breeding with a ton of genetics, mm -hmm. keeping our our breeding funnel open, and really working really big hit inbreds okay. with, with a, a lot of populations yeah. we're driving genetic gain doing that but we're also thinking about the intermediate long-term consequences yeah, of that so <laughs> what we're doing here is, is screening genetics that would work in the corn belt yep. uh, we're, we're screening a subsample of them that were chosen um, optimally to represent our diversity out here okay and we come through here and we, we screen them um, yeah. This is obviously these two are susceptible sure. you got sure. some better tolerance over here yep. nope. we capture that genetic signal and we can make genetic predictions now on every every genetics that's coming in that we want to test further to, and get a pretty accurate uh, read on northern leaf blight. So basically, out here, you would never treat for anything like that. You would deliberately you kind of let you want to let it if it gets stored. destroyed, it gets destroyed. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, we, we we rely on a lot of natural. Sure. In infection. And if I see something like this, it's going out because I can't have this. Yeah, it's absolutely. too big of a risk, especially oh, yeah. corn on corn. Yeah. yeah. In the past, we would try to screen as much as we could by, by placing every genetics we were testing for northern leaf blight, but that's impossible. And then you don't get the disease every year in your disease yeah. nurseries. Sure. If we take a, a good subset, we can build a, not, a really pr predictive genetic model there, and we can predict every year, every genetics, gotcha. every, all the time. So that's what we're doing here. And this is just one disease, northern leaf blight. We're doing the same thing for gray leaf spot, Goss's wilt, southern um, rust, southern leaf blight, et cetera. We can do all those piece, all those key traits that, that lead to you know, sustainability. We can do that.